Hi, everyone. This is Reza Shadmer. One of the surprising aspects of behavior is that animals tend to learn easily, but have a hard time unlearning. That is, learning is easy, but surprisingly, unlearning is hard. To give you an example of this, let's look at one of my favorite little creatures, the honeybee. One can take the honeybee and teach it a simple task. Whenever you present a odor, say of a carnation flower to the animal, you then pair it with the nectar. And so the animal learns that, well, if the odor is present, there's likely to be a reward. And so it extends its proboscis. And so you can measure the probability of that response as a function of training trials. And you see that say after three epochs of training, the animal has learned pretty well this association. And what you can then do is that you can look at the memory that it forms. And you can see that, well, an hour later, two hours later, even a couple of days later, the animal has a pretty good memory of what it had learned, that association. But now let's take another group of animals and again, train it on that same association, but now try to erase this memory. So typically what is done is that you present the odor, but you don't present the nectar. So trial after trial, the animal learns that, well, maybe I shouldn't be associating these two things. And so it extinction takes place. It extinguishes this association between the stimulus and the response. But what's remarkable is that if you now wait a little while, say an hour, two hours, four hours, even a couple of days, what you see is what's called spontaneous recovery of memory. So we learn that despite the fact that we try to extinguish this memory, that training didn't erase the previously acquired relationship. Somehow it masked it temporarily. And with passage of time, the original memory brought itself out. So what's going on here? So this idea that there is spontaneous recovery of memory isn't just there in honeybees. It's really present in a wide spectrum of behaviors across many um, different species. And to give you an example of it, let's focus on something that's simple and we can do it in humans as well as other primates, a saccade. Suppose I have you look at the stimulus here and I present you with a target. What you do is that you move your eyes from here to here, and that's called a saccade. Now, suppose as you made the saccade, I'm gonna present something novel, an error. I'm gonna jump the target upward so that at the end of your saccade, the target isn't on your fovea, but yet there is this error associated with it. So what happens now is that your brain learns from this error and alters the saccade on the next trial. So on the next trial, when I give you this target, you will make a saccade, but it will be slightly curved toward the direction of that previous error. If the errors persist, that saccade will become more and more curved. So the brain learns from this error and alters the motor commands that is producing in response to the stimulus in order to minimize that endpoint error. If one quantifies this, you'll see something like this. You present the error over some number of trials, and if those errors persist, what you'll see is that the movement responds, the brain adapts from that error. Now, suppose at the end of this training, what we do is that, again, present you with a target, but jump it down rather than jumping it upward. So now the error has reversed direction. And just like you would expect, this is going to cause extinction, trial after trial, the saccades return to their straight line trajectory. But now let's do something interesting. So you see that behavior now returns to more or less the baseline. Suppose now I again present you with the stimulus to the right, you make a saccade to it, but what I'm gonna do is that place that target so there's no longer any errors at the end of your movement. This is called an error clamped to zero condition. What happens is that despite the fact that there are no more errors, the saccades become curved again, and they become curved in the direction of that initial learning. So despite the fact that we did extinction and that extinction caused the behavior to return to near baseline, removal of the errors and passage of time in humans in this motor learning task resulted in spontaneous recovery of memory. So it is the case that this spontaneous recovery is present in many learning systems. And indeed, it produces a challenge. For example, in memory of fearful events, when a memory has been acquired, the attempt to extinguish it often is 
beneficial for the short term, but in the long term, there can be spontaneous recovery. Motion adaptation presents a similar condition. Prism adaptation, when people adapt to prism glasses and then they try to unadapt, de-adapt to it, afterwards they show spontaneous recovery. Saccade adaptation, like I just showed you, that also has a similar phenomenon. Contrast adaptation has it. Reach adaptation has similar properties. So it seems like extinction in many domains across many different species doesn't really erase memories. So why does memory exhibit this spontaneous recovery after extinction training? What does it tell us about the foundations of learning? So to approach this problem, let's put together a simple model. Suppose that we're gonna imagine learning as cooperation between multiple systems. So we have a scenario where we're gonna do something, perform an action, and as we perform that action, we can predict what will be the consequences of that action. The environment provides us with the actual consequences. We compare what we predicted with what we actually measured, and the difference is an error. That error is gonna cause plasticity in the parts of our brain that were responsible for making those predictions. Now imagine <clears throat> that the brain is of course composed of many systems. And so perhaps many systems are contributing to this prediction that we described. So let's formalize this with a couple of simple equations. Suppose that what we have is we have our predictions being composed of two systems. One is a fast learning system, the other a slow learning system. So your predictions are a sum of contributions from these two different learning systems. When you make a prediction, you compare it to what you observe. The difference between those two, if it is different than zero, it will be the error. And that's called the prediction error. And this is the basis of learning. The prediction error is gonna cause changes in each of these systems. Now, we're gonna imagine that that fast learning system learns a lot from error, but forgets quickly. On the other hand, the slow learning system learns from the same error, but it has a basically reduced sensitivity. It learns only a little from that error. However, it has the advantage that it retains well. So suppose this was the case. Let's simulate these simple equations and let's see what would happen. So to summarize, we have a fast learning system that has high sensitivity to error, but forgets quickly. We have a slow learning system that has low sensitivity to error. However, what it brings, what it learns, it tends to retain. Okay, so here's our typical adaptation. curve. This is the behavior that the subject exhibits when they are learning. Now, underneath this adaptation lurks two different systems. There's a fast system that learns quickly, but has poor retention. A slow learning system that learns slowly, but has good retention. The sum of these two curves is this red curve, the adaptation. Suppose now we introduce extinction. We reverse the errors. So we bring behavior back to baseline. When we did that, these two states that were the basis of our behavior change. However, you notice that they don't go back to baseline. The slow state learns a little bit. The fast state learns a lot, the sum of these two gives you that apparent return to baseline, that apparent change that says things have been returned. However, now, if we allow time to pass, we remove the errors and simply allow time to pass, the fast state rapidly decays, the slow state slowly decays, the sum of these two curves is spontaneous recovery. So here we have a simple model that says, Perhaps the reason why extinction wasn't successful is because it didn't really return our state to the baseline condition. Well, does this simple model help us understand how the brain actually learns from error? Okay, so to get us closer to that, to that question, let's focus on our task again, our saccade task. And the reason why we want to do that is because we know a lot about control of saccades and the neural basis of it in the brain. And it turns out the critical region for learning from error in the saccade task is the cerebellum. Why do I say that? Let me show you an example. Suppose that we go back to our task, we make a saccade, we experience an error, and that error 
causes adaptation. Trial after trial, we learn from the error. Then what we do is that we produce extinction. Our curved saccades are gonna return back to baseline. And then we remove the errors and we see spontaneous recovery. So spontaneous recovery returns our saccades back toward what we had learned before. So say now what we do is that we look at some uh, individuals who have had damage to the cerebellum, the cerebellar patients. And what we see is that they are impaired. They do not learn as well, suggesting that the cerebellum has something to do from this task that we described. This somehow it is helping the system learn from error. But the problem is cerebellar damage doesn't just produce a learning deficit. It fundamentally produces a movement deficit. So it isn't just that these individuals have trouble learning from error, they're having trouble making movements. Let me show you that. Here's a patient with cerebellar damage. Let's focus on how he's making saccades as he's trying to move his eyes from left to right and then back. What you're seeing is that the movements start out fine, but they somehow do not stop on target properly. This is shown in the figures that you see here. So the red is the trajectory of the eye for the patient. The blue is for a healthy individual. The target is here in the dotted line. And what you see is that the saccade starts out just fine, but then it overshoots. And then it, he's trying to correct, he overshoots again, tries to correct, overshoots again. So only through a successive process is finally able to bring the eyes on target. And when you think about life with cerebellar damage, you can imagine how absolutely difficult it must be to simply do uh, something like reading a book. It would be um, exhausting. And indeed, this is the case. So what we have here is that we have a learning disorder when we have cerebellar damage, but we also have a movement disorder. So to study learning from error, what we need to do is first understand what is it that the cerebellum is predicting and why is it that the movements are becoming dysmetric because of damage to the cerebellum. So as I mentioned, fortunately, we know a lot about controlling saccades. So let's briefly go over what the role of the cerebellum might be. Well, in order for you to make a saccade, what you have is that you have information from your retina that arrives on the superior colliculus. And the superior colliculus has access to the specialized machinery in the brainstem that can produce a saccade. However, the colliculus is not trusted with this task of directing your gaze. Rather, that decision about whether you're gonna make a saccade or not is evaluated by your cortex, particularly the frontal eye field and regions in the parietal cortex, as well as the basal ganglia. These regions assign value to the stimuli around you and ultimately come up with a decision of where you should direct your gaze. Once that decision is made, the colliculus is allowed to produce the commands that are needed to make the movement. A copy of those commands is sent to the cerebellum. The cerebellum evaluates those commands and sends back predictions about what's about to happen. So if the colliculus did not have the cerebellum, what will happen is that it could not make saccades that are well-made. Basically, they would start out okay, but not end on the target. Their precision is guaranteed by what, by what the cerebellum is doing. So you might say, all right, Reza, this seems like so simple. So you have this side loop that's making predictions. And of course, we're talking about saccades, a task that has been studied for more than five decades. What's the problem? Indeed, absolute giants in the field have studied control of this simple behavior. But as I will show you, the basic problem remains that when we measure neural activity in the cerebellum during saccades, as well as other movements, we really have a hard time understanding what is being predicted by the cerebellum. And so if we're trying to study learning, if we're trying to understand why do memories show spontaneous recovery and all of these interesting patterns, things that have something to do with the cerebellum, I think we first need to understand what is the cerebellum predicting? Because first, by understanding the prediction, we can understand this concept of prediction error, which then causes learning. Fortunately, the cerebellum is relatively simple in that it is a three-layer neural network. Input arrives to the first layer. It is then sent to 
the intermediate layer where the Purkinje cell lies, and finally to the nuclear nucleus cells in which uh, predictions are made. A copy of these predictions is sent to the inferior olive where the predictions are compared to the observation resulting in what are called prediction errors. And what's interesting is that the prediction error arrives via extremely strong synapses on the Purkinje cells and relatively weak synapses to the nucleus cells. So somehow the predictions errors are particularly important for this intermediate layer, for this hidden layer. So let me show you what that looks like. I'm gonna show you a recording from Purkinje cells. And let's take a few seconds and listen to the output of the Purkinje. What you notice is that there are two kinds of spikes here. There are spikes that you're familiar with, these regular spikes, but there's also these occasional, about one hertz, these second spikes. These are called complex spikes. These are called simple spikes. So the predictions that the Purkinje cells are making are those simple spikes that are being sent to the nuclear cells. Whereas the prediction error that's arriving back to the Purkinje cells are these complex spikes. So the prediction errors are conveyed to the Purkinje cells resulting in complex spikes. Here's something remarkable about the cerebellum. The Purkinje cells allow us to record both the predictions that are being made and the errors that are being conveyed back to it from the inferior olive. Okay. So that's perhaps interesting, but now the question is, okay, what are we gonna do with this information? Because remember, we were trying to understand what is the cerebellum predicting? Well, it turns out our problem has to do with the fact that activity of these Purkinje cells during movements like saccades are really quite difficult to interpret. Let me show you an example. So here's our subject, this beautiful little creature called the marmoset. These are small primates that um, live in the Amazon jungle. And um, like other primates, they're visual animals, so they make saccades. So here's an example of a saccade made to the left visual field. Here's a saccade made to the right visual field. And here's a Purkinje cell and its activity. So you notice that it has baseline activity, it pauses, and then it comes back up after the saccade is over. But what you notice is that the saccade is over, but the Purkinje cell has continued to pause, and then it recovers. So it seems like the activity in this cell lasts much longer than the movement itself. Here's another cell, it also pauses. There's a third cell doing something a little bit more complicated. This one bursts, this one bursts and pauses. This one bursts and this one also bursts. But what you notice is that in all cases, activities of individual Purkinje cells remain modulated long after the movement ends. And so we need to first solve this puzzle. Because on the one hand, we saw that damage to the cerebellum makes it so that you know, the, the, the individual has trouble controlling the end point of their movement. But when we look at activity of individual cells, there's nothing special happening near the end of the movement. In fact, what's happening is that the, the cells tend to be active much longer than the movement itself. So how is this possible? How is it that on the one hand, you have these cells that are just you know, active two to three times longer than the movement, on the other hand, Damage makes it so that you have trouble only near the end of your movement. That's the puzzle. To approach this problem, I'm gonna to present to you a, a, a hypothesis and it's basically an anatomical hypothesis. And the idea is to put together Purkinje cells based on a feature in anatomy and it's called population group. The idea goes like this. Purkinje cells, we think, form groups that project onto single nucleus neurons. So about 50 Purkinje cells project onto a single nucleus neuron, which then sends the output of the cerebellum to be compared to the observation, resulting in error. This error is fed back to the Purkinje cells, and those were the complex spikes that I showed you. The basic hypothesis is that the Purkinje cells that belong to a population all receive similar inputs from the olive, meaning that the cells that project together to a single nucleus neuron, they have something in common. And what they have in common is that they receive a similar error information. So they specialize in some particular form of the error. So if we knew what that feature was for the Purkinje cells, if we knew what error they specialized in, then what we could do based on this hypothesis is organize the neurons based on that feature into populations 
and then look to see as a population, what are they predicting? So that's the basic idea of population coding in the cerebellum based on a coding for error. So what is this coding for error? So because we need to, under, if we're gonna organize the Purkinje cells into populations, we're gonna to have to understand something about how prediction error is, is conveyed to them. So the key is the superior collections. And let me explain this idea to you. Suppose that you're looking at the stimulus here at center, I present for you a, a, a target. So when you're looking at the stimulus, there's activity in the rostral pole of the superior colliculus. When I present for you a target, that target produces visual activity and that results in activity in a region to the caudal part of the colliculus. When you decide to make a saccade, this activity rises and you generate a saccade that brings your eyes to where the target was. Now, after your saccade is completed, you expect that there will be activity in the rostral pole where the stimulus should be on your fovea. But in fact, the stimulus isn't there, it's up here, there's an error. So there is unexpected activity here in this region of the colliculus. So the blue is where the activity would normally be if your eyes land on target. Red is where the activity actually is because that's where the sensory consequences are detected. So this error that we've been talking about is really unexpected activity among neurons in a specific part of this visual space that's mapped onto the superior colliculus. So you made the saccade, the actual sensory consequences were activity in this part of the colliculus. That's sent to the inferior olive. The olive compares it to the predictions that were made by the cerebellum. The result is this prediction error. And the idea is that, okay, if we understood the coding of this error by the, by, by the, the climbing fibers, these complex spikes, we would be able to then organize our Purkinje cells into groups. So how do we do this? Well, the first step is we need to understand how each Purkinje cell responds to this prediction error, because that's the feature is gonna be the key for us to put them together as a population. How do we do this? Well, we have our subject make a saccade. So she's looking at the fixation point, we present a target and she makes a saccade. And now what we're gonna do is that we're gonna to jump to target at some random location, say to the left or to the right. When it jumps to the left, we're gonna record from this Purkinje cell. What we see are that these red dots are the complex spikes that it produces. These, green, so these blue dots are the simple spikes. So when the saccade ends at time zero and the brain detects that there's an error, in this case, you see there are some complex spikes that occur afterwards. However, when the stimulus jumps to the right, the errors to the right, you see that there are far fewer complex spikes here. And what we can do is jump the target in various directions, measure the response of the Purkinje cell to error, those complex spikes. And the result is a tuning function. So this particular Purkinje cell prefers errors to the left. And the idea is now, in order for us to understand these predictions that are being made by these regular simple spikes, we first have to understand the population coding via these complex spikes. So th in this case, this particular Purkinje cell preferred errors to the left. So this P cell responded to leftward visual errors. All right, so we detected this particular feature of this Purkinje cell. It's telling us that there's a part of the superior colliculus that this Purkinje cell is receiving error feedback from. Okay, that's our first bit of information. We can look at the response of the Purkinje cell, the complex spikes to error. And of course, just like you would expect, when the complex, when the errors to the direction of preference, there is increase in the probability of complex spikes. And when the errors in the opposite direction, there is reduction in the probability of complex spikes. Okay, so the first step was measure the response to error. We just did that. Now, how are we gonna use that information? The idea is to use this error preference to define a new coordinate system, not the coordinate system Cartesian, right zero up 90 degrees, but the coordinate system of the superior colliculus. So how are we gonna do? Well, first let's look at the, basically the distribution of preferred errors. So this is a group of Purkinje cells that happen to be to the right of the cerebellar vermis. And what you see is that some of them prefer upward errors, some of them preferred errors to the left, some of them prefer downward errors and so forth. 
most of them have a leftward bias, which means the Purkinje cells on the right of the vermis, most of them receive information about this sensory consequence of movements from the contralateral superior colliculus. All right, but however, you see there's great diversity. Okay, so what we're gonna now do is that for each Purkinje cell, use its error representation, its CS on vector to define a new coordinate system. And it goes like this. Suppose we have one Purkinje cell and it prefers these leftward errors. That's its preferred error. You make a saccade in 45 degrees. And we call this a 45 degree saccade because of arbitrary notion of zero being to the right and 90 being upwards, right? That's just the way we think of Cartesian coordinates. Let's rotate our coordinate system so that it's aligned to the preferred error of this Purkinje cell. So now this saccade that we used to call a 45 degree saccade becomes a CS on plus 250 degree saccade. So what do we just do? We change the coordinate system from Cartesian coordinates to basically an error-based coordinates. Why did we do that? Because we think that the critical information that puts these Purkinje cells together is a preference for error. So what we want to do is to organize all the cells that prefer this specific error. Okay, so let's go back to our basic problem. When we recorded individual cells during a saccade, we saw bursting, we saw pausing, we saw bursting and pausing, all of this complexity. Now what we're going to do is form a population by organizing the cells into groups that share a similar preference for error. So I no longer gonna have rightward or upward saccades. I'm gonna have saccades in directions that depend on my preferred error. So for example, direction CS plus 180. When I make a saccade in that direction, there are some Purkinje cells that burst, some that pause, and you notice that their activity is modulated long after the movement. But if we now put together these Purkinje cells as a population, something truly remarkable happens. What you see is that the firing rates start with a burst and then they pause. And what's rather remarkable is that the activity ends precisely when the movement ends. So you see a burst and then a pause and then a stopping of the modulation. And this activity is highly dependent on the direction of the saccade. So when the saccade is made in CS plus or minus 90 or CS on, you see that this pattern changes. So what one sees is a activity now that kind of makes sense. It seems to be telling us something about how these neurons are making predictions about this ongoing movement. We can look at it a little bit more closely. Suppose that we look at saccades that are slow and small amplitude, medium, and um, uh, amplitudes are a little bit larger. And finally, large amplitudes and fast. And what you see are two changes that occurred in the population response. The burst grows with the velocity of the forthcoming saccade. And then there's this pause and the pause is time locked to the onset of the deceleration. So there is this burst pattern followed by a pause. The burst grows as the magnitude of the future movement the pause is time locked to when you should begin deceleration. Let's summarize where we are. We started with the question, how do we think about activity of individual cells in order to put together them into populations? What we did was that we organized the Purkinje cells into groups, and these groups were based on a preference for prediction error. We divided up these neurons into these labels that some preferred errors upward, some preferred errors rightward, and so forth. We organized neurons in this way. And when we did that, the simple spikes, the output of these Purkinje cells as a population predicted features of the ongoing saccade, particularly timing of deceleration onset. So it appears that the Purkinje cells are predicting when the movement should be stopped. Okay. So Purkinje cells are inhibitory neurons. And so it's really remarkable to think how inhibitory neurons can produce an output that will affect your behavior. So we had this idea that Purkinje cells project onto nucleus neurons and through changes in their firing rates, they will influence behavior. And what did we see in terms of changes in firing rates? We saw a burst followed by a pause, an inhibition followed by disinhibition. So this is one way by which 
you can produce an output. However, a much more interesting way by which you can produce an output is by synchronizing the activity within that population. So don't just produce spikes willy-nilly to inhibit the nucleus neurons, but produce spikes that are aligned in time with each other so that you can then synchronize the activity in time and therefore potentially entrain the nucleus cell. Let me show you how that might happen. So what we're gonna do now is look at slice preparations. And in slice, one can control precisely the timing of activity in these Purkinje cells that project onto the single nucleus neuron. And when one does that, one sees something remarkable. Suppose that these Purkinje cells are firing at some baseline firing rate, but their activity is not synchronous. Well, they simply inhibit the nucleus, not much happening as an output in the nucleus neuron. However, if that same activity is there, but now about 50% of the Purkinje cells are synchronized with each other. So they produce a spike at the same time. Then what you see is something interesting. There is now output from the cerebellum and that output occurs right after this entrained input is arriving. The synchronous input is arriving from the Purkinje cells. So if Purkinje cells could synchronize these spikes, they would entrain the nucleus neuron. This gives us a question. Do these Purkinje cells send their predictions, not just via firing rates, but by synchronizing their stimuli, by their spikes within these populations? And does this synchronization potentially play a role in controlling movements? What I will show you is that indeed, within a population, Purkinje cells not only modulate their firing rates in a way that makes sense, they also synchronize their spikes. So what we have here is again, recording from are little, little primates. But what's interesting is that because they're small, one can record from many Purkinje cells simultaneously using the modern electrodes that are available. And what one sees is the following. So again, we have the burst followed by a pause. But what's interesting is that when there's increase in firing, there's no change in the synchronous activity of the Purkinje cells. However, when there is this pausing take place, when there are fewer spikes that are being sent to inhibit the nucleus, that is when those spikes become synchronous. And so synchrony is occurring near the end of the movement when you're trying to stop that movement. And indeed, the firing rates and the synchrony depend strongly on the direction that you're moving with respect to the preferred error that you expect. So within groups that prefer a specific error, Purkinje cells combine their firing rates with synchrony to predict when the movement should be stopped. Okay, now we started out with a fundamentally different question, right? So I started my talk by talking about spontaneous recovery, which is a problem in learning. We, want, we were trying to understand why unlearning is difficult and why memory exhibits spontaneous recovery. We went along the side road because we first had to understand what is being predicted. And we saw now that what's being predicted are features of the ongoing movement, particularly when to stop. And we saw that this happened if we organize the neurons based on a particular hypothesis that they preferred the same error. So what does this tell us about the process of learning and why there is spontaneous recovery? Let me describe now these two things in a single framework. So suppose you make a movement and you experience an error. Say so here's the error. Suppose it's a rightward error. Now, what that means is that in the cerebellum, there are a group of cells on the left side of the vermis that prefer that error. They prefer rightward errors. For them, that error is in their preferred direction. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna learn from this error and that learning suppresses their activity. So trial by trial, their simple spikes become, their number becomes smaller and smaller, the firing rate declines. So these errors are gonna produce adaptation. The adaptation is accompanied by this plasticity that produces reduced number of simple spikes. That same error to the right is also going to be transmitted to neurons on the right side of the cerebellum. These neurons happen to like leftward errors. So for them, this error is anti-preferred. However, that also produces plasticity, but in the opposite direction. So these neurons will increase their activity. So they go from a small amount of activity during the saccade to a larger amount of activity. So that single error 
produces plasticity in multiple regions. Now, what's remarkable is that the regions that prefer that error, the Purkinje cells that prefer that error will learn quickly. The ones that do not prefer the error will learn slowly. And that's shown here. So these are the Purkinje cells that preferred the error. The error for them was in the CSR direction. They exhibit fast learning because the error is in the preferred direction. These neurons also receive that error information, but that error is in their anti-preferred direction. These neurons also learn, but they learn slowly. So the interaction between these two gives us a sense of why one cannot simply unlearn by reversing the direction of the error. Why is unlearning difficult? Our paradigm was learn via a certain direction of error, cause extinction by reversing the error, then remove that error by producing it to zero and look to see what happens and you see spontaneous recovery. In the cerebellum, neurons may be organized based on preference for error. Some prefer upward errors, some prefer downward errors. Each group specializes in a specific error direction. Why? Because they're getting information from a specific part of the superior colliculus. A single error produces changes in many Purkinje cells, induces plasticity. Some preferring that error, others not. Those that prefer the error learn fast. They get a lot of complex spikes. Those that don't will have a suppression of their complex spikes. Now, when we reverse the error, when we're doing extinction training, what we're doing is engaging a new group of Purkinje cells that prefer this new error. So this differing rates of learning and decay in the various Purkinje cells may underlie what we've seen in behavior, which is spontaneous recovery. So obviously, there is a lot of work left to be done to connect these dots. And indeed, there are many limitations to the story that I've been telling you. However, we can talk about these limitations and because they really highlight the work that's needed. The first limitation, I think, is the idea that the complex spikes that I've been showing you may not be really transmitting error information because this, this fact by itself is something that's debated. So we definitely need experiments that can dissociate sensory prediction errors from movements that follow them and really better understand the representation of error in the cerebellum. The second problem is that I've been focusing on those Purkinje cells, but you know, Purkinje cells are not the output of the cerebellum. So we need to really understand the output of the cerebellum and the predictions that the nucleus neurons are making. So we need experiments that record from the nucleus neurons, organize them into populations. And we don't know how to do that yet. And perhaps we can use error information also to organize the nucleus neurons into populations. Finally, the most interesting aspect and perhaps the road for future direction is that what I showed you is that in the cerebellum, predictions are conveyed both via firing rates and a temporal code, synchronization of spikes. So what this implies is that learning from error may involve not just changes in firing rates, but plasticity that affects spike synchrony among populations of neurons. That would be an interesting thing to follow. Okay, to summarize, we began with the puzzle that is hard to unlearn. Many kinds of learning systems exhibit spontaneous recovery following extinction. Our theory suggested that this phenomenon may be due to fast and slow learning systems. We built a marmoset lab and used high density probes to record from the cerebellum. We organized the Purkinje cells based on a shared preference for error via their complex spikes and then looked at the resulting population simple spike response. And we found that the simple spikes of the population encoded movement kinematics particularly during deceleration, the simple spike synchronized, predicting when to stop the movement. When an error occurred, one population of neurons learned slowly, while another population learned fast. So the implication is unlearning is difficult because a change in error engages a different group of neurons than those that initially learned, producing masking, but not necessary, necessarily unlearning. All right, my life has been enriched because of the mentorship that I have received from Emilio Bizzi, Sandra Musevaldi, and Michael Arbib. And my life has also been enriched because of the friendship that I've had with colleagues, 
that have contributed to my life in science. Finally, I've been really fortunate to have had students that have contributed, in this case, to the research that I showed you, these wonderful men and women who have had the pleasure of me being their teacher, a fraction of whom are presented here in this, in this slide. To end, let me describe, I've read for you a, a, a poet, a poet uh, of the 14th century, Hafez, who um, in a few lines says, says many things that I think are absolutely beautiful. He says, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that, it lights the whole sky. Thank you for your time.